we're live. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining this awesome, awesome session. Uh, we have on board Jeremy. Um, Jeremy is the head of XR for PwC UK. He's an amazing mentor. He's my mentor, actually, right? And um, I'm following up with him a lot on LinkedIn, and the updates he's been sharing. He, he, he currently inspires a lot of people that want to get started with XR, and I'm super excited to have him share his insights and also the topic that he'll be sharing. So thank you so much, Jeremy. The pleasure is all mine, Arome. Let me uh, and and thank you thank you so much to to you and the organisers for putting this on. I think it's a a fantastic showcase of the the innovation that's coming out of Africa with regard to XR. And uh, yeah, so my my hat off to you for uh, for putting in the work and the team for for making it happen. Thank you so, so much. I'm just going to no worries. I'm just going to share um, my screen. Start? Um, sorry, before you start, Emilio is going to read yes, this on my... Oh, yeah. Sorry, Emilio, so story yeah, of thunder. Well, thank you, Arome, for a yeah. good Thank you for joining us. Just a quick introduction to the audience. Um, Jeremy leads PwC's XR team, uh, helping clients implement uh, virtual reality and augmented reality technology. Um, he is a public speaker and the author of Reality Check, uh, www.realitycheckxr.com. It's www.realitycheckxr.com, a book about XR in business. You must check that out. He is also featured in the Financial Times, uh, The Economist, uh, the BBC and others. Um, he has worked with organisations like the World Economic Forum and currently sits on the advisory board of Immerse UK to support businesses interested in immersive technologies. Um, the topic for Jeremy's um, session is misconceptions of XR technology. Over to you, sir. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, Emilios. And very kind words. I appreciate it. So I'm going to share my screen with everyone now. There we go. We should be able to see that. So welcome, everyone, to Misconceptions of XR. In this talk, I'm going to be talking to you about what I think are some of the, the misunderstandings, is another good word for it, or myths behind the technology itself. And there are quite a few of them out there. We won't go through all of them today. Otherwise, I probably need a, a whole day session. But we'll cover some of the, the more uh, prevalent ones. And we can, we can chat about them together. Just let us know if you want to type in any questions on, uh, on the platform you're watching, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, uh, anywhere else. And um, we'll get the questions fielded at the end. I'll do my best to answer them. So let's start with the first misconception. A lot of us think that virtual reality and even augmented reality to some extent is all about headsets, you know, headsets like this one that uh, you put on and uh, you're immersed in a completely virtual environment. Now, that is the most well understood form of virtual reality and augmented reality. However, what do you think caves, mobiles and screens have in common? Fact is, all three of those are actually elements or ways of engaging with both virtual reality and augmented reality technology. So the picture on the left-hand side is actually from a, uh, a cave-like system in the University of Leeds here in the UK. And they use this system, which is basically projection technology. So using projectors to um, paint a picture of an entirely digital environment in which your position is tracked, just like a headset. But instead of having something um, over your head covering you uh, or disconnecting you from the real world, you are still feeling like you're in the real world. You can have multiple users in that environment and you can see each other while also being in this completely virtual world. When it comes to smartphones, those have been used in the past, you may have seen um, in virtual reality. The uh, headsets like the Gear VR and the Google Cardboard um, proposition comes to mind. But most prevalently, we see it being used in augmented reality. So there are actually 2 billion smartphones out there right now that are very capable of producing high-end augmented reality. And that's absolutely amazing because that means that the technology is there in our pockets. On the right-hand side, is a picture of GlaxoSmithKline's Science Shopper Lab in West London. 
And uh, so for those of you who don't know, GlaxoSmithKline is a pharmaceuticals company. And they have a consumer research division, and you can see part of it here, where they use a really large screen to get people to feel like they're completely immersed in, in this case, a pharmacy. Now, why would you want to do that? It's because the application, you want to try and understand how consumers are engaging with different formats, different layouts, different ways of merchandising the products on the shelves. So it's a great business application, the idea of using virtual reality for consumer research, but it doesn't have to be done only through a head mounted display. Really big one here, and this is this is going to be the chunky one. If I asked everyone, where have you heard of virtual reality or augmented reality? Likelihood is you've probably read about it in a paper. Maybe you've got a, a friend who's got one now. You know, they're becoming a bit more mainstream in society. Um, but I would I would venture to guess that most of most people, at least those in the non XR industry have heard of virtual reality and augmented reality in the context of video games or some form of entertainment like Pokemon Go or Beat Saber and so on. The problem with that, though, is that when we hear so many stories about virtual reality and augmented reality being used for games uh, and for entertainment and for fun, we forget that it has potential outside of that arena as well. It has ma virtual reality and augmented reality has incredible potential to change the world, the world of, of business, as well as our personal lives. In PwC, we produced a report in collaboration with our economics team. And uh, what we found is that by 2030, we expect XR technologies to boost GDP globally by 2030 by up to one and a half trillion dollars. So an incredible impact on the world. But where is this all coming from and how is it being built? There are a few areas that feed into this, this one and a half trillion dollar figure. And a lot of them are written here, but I'm just going to give you an overview. Virtual reality can be used for collaboration to bring people together and make them feel more connected to get them to analyze a product and take it to market more quickly. It can be used to engage people on soft skills. It can be used to train people on practical skills or hard skills. It can be used for remote assistance so that you have field engineers back at base that are transmitting information onto the real world of the engineers in front of them. It can be used for visualization of utilities. It can be used as a research tool, as we said before, a sales and marketing tool, an advertising medium. There are so many areas that virtual reality and augmented reality impacts. It's fair for me to say that no matter what industry you can think of, virtual reality and augmented reality has an application, and not only just an application, a really valuable application in that industry as well. Here are a few in a little bit more detail. Some of you um, might know this company if, uh, if you're connected to the Chinese market. This is a sneaker seller um, called Poison, P-O-I-Z-O-N. And they worked with a British German startup called Viking to allow consumers to actually try on their products regardless of where, wherever they are. And that's, and that's using augmented reality technology on the mobile phone, as you can see. The picture on the left-hand side is a picture of, of the app uh, with the product listings on it. And you can see the price there, the name of the shoes. The picture on the right is actually after clicking a button in the application where it opens up the camera on your phone, it figures out where your feet are, and then digitally slams on the, the shoes that you're interested in onto your feet. Um, and that's absolutely amazing because then you can get to see what is that really like? You know, how does how do these shoes look on me? And as a result, that can drive greater consumer engagement, greater sales in organizations. So a real valuable business tool there. Virtual reality, or this is augmented reality rather, has been used to reveal structures and, and environments that we can't even see with our naked eye because in this case, they're utilities that flow beneath the ground um, under us. And so here you can see the bottom picture is a network of pipes, um, cables, 
conduits carrying gas, electricity, network, telecommunications, cables, all this sort of stuff. And the company that actually produces this is a, is a company called Viges. And um, they specialize just in, in, in doing this, in helping to bring the hidden worlds of underground utilities to light. And that is not only an efficiency creator in getting people to understand very quickly where all the, the, uh, the pipes and cables are, but it's also a health and safety enabler as well. Many, many workers, unfortunately, are, are, are injured or even die each year as a result of striking pipes uh, that they weren't aware were there or they miscalculated where exactly they would be. But with augmented reality, you can visualize those and create a more accurate image of where those, where those pipes are going to be and hopefully avoid those accidents. This is, a, this is an old application. Um, in fact, the, the picture is quite old. It's from Ford. And uh, for those of you who don't know Ford, the automotive manufacturer, they've been involved in virtual reality for a very long time. So a lot of us think that virtual reality has only been around since 2012 when we started hearing about the Oculus Rift. But uh, Ford and, and other companies like them have been using virtual reality since the early 2000s, late 90s even in some cases. And here, what you can see is an industrial engineer at Ford in virtual reality trying to perform an action that is not yet needed to be performed in the real world, but he's practicing the procedure for the next generation of vehicles that they're going to build. But they've got to practice how they do that on the, on, the, on the factory line, because if they get it wrong, it can lead to you know, ergonomic problems. It can lead to you, know, you pulling your back out because you're extending too much. But if you simulate this environment and how you want to do this production line in virtual reality, and here you can see a 3D printed version of the part that's going to be used, you can understand the strains of the human body um, that you're planning to put them under and hopefully optimize them before you get to the actual production line. So this is um, La Liga. So for those of you who are interested in, in football, La Liga actually enhanced their viewing for, for uh, their audiences. And on the left-hand side here, you can see um, an empty stadium uh, because this was COVID, COVID in, the, in the, the deep depths of COVID-19 and people weren't allowed to go to stadiums. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, a, a superimposed digital crowd um, which La Liga put on there to bring some sense of familiarity to the audiences. And a little bit of trivia for you, La Liga actually got in touch with Electronic Arts, the, the games publishing company and development company, to get some of the sounds from FIFA. So if any of you play FIFA um, on, on your consoles or computer, some of the sounds were also introduced into the game here, even though there was no crowd uh, there in an effort to try and bring back the, the atmosphere of, of, of a game where nobody could attend physically. This is an example from the Red Cross, or, um, uh, or more accurately, the ICRC, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross. And uh, they have an, an amazing uh, group, a team that is dedicated to virtual reality technology where, and they do many, many things in virtual reality. And this is one example of how they've used it to try and acclimatize individual to challenging environments, to war zones, uh, to areas uh, with lots of difficulties by simulating that environment in virtual reality so that people are better prepared when they go to those, uh, those zones later on. Next big misconception, and this is a slightly technical one, but for those of you who are not in the XR industry, I'll explain. 360 video, which is the represented by the image on the left-hand side, is a type of content that's often used in virtual reality. Computer-generated content is also used, and that's represented by the right-hand side. What I mean by that is 360 video is you where you put a camera in the middle of a location, and just like you have a normal camera, it takes a, a video or a picture of that location, but it doesn't only take a small rectangular picture, it takes a picture or a video all around you, hence the 360 degree video. Computer generated environments, on the other hand, start and end their life in the computer world, in the digital world. They, you are building things from scratch using a game engine like Unity or Unreal, you're creating 3D objects, tables, mountains, whatever it is, 
and they both have their, their pros and cons. But in the XR industry, there is some controversy about whether 360 video is, is a valid form of VR because people often see it as, you know, not as interactive, not as immersive. Um, you you can't quite move in with 360 video, um, but you can look around. And what I would say to that is 360 video and computer generated content are both forms of technology at the same time. If you watch 360 video on a computer screen, then then yes, that is just a you know a casual a usual 2D experience, and and it'd be it'll be difficult to argue that that's virtual reality. However, if you take that same content, that same 360 video, and you now put it in a virtual reality headset that I can then look around myself and interact with in that way and experience, then by my definition, that is 100% virtual reality, just not as high fidelity perhaps on with not as much ability to interact, let's say. Computer generated content, you can have the same argument. Computer generated content can be virtual reality when you're experiencing it in such an immersive way. But when I'm playing a video game on my laptop, you know, and it's a small 13 inch here laptop I've got, then it's very difficult to ascribe that to virtual reality itself. On the argument particularly about 360 video not being interactive, that's not true at all. So in addition to you being able to look around the environment, which is a form of interaction in itself, you can actually create 360 video and build what's called multi-branch narrative scenarios. Now, what, what you're seeing here is an example of something we did like that, where we used a multi-branch 360 video experience to immerse 300 business leaders in a cybersecurity attack on their organization. And you can see part of that, that 300 group here. And we did it simultaneously, all 300 of them in the same room. We had to build our own network infrastructure for that and, and set it up. It was, it was complicated. On the right-hand side, what you're seeing is a snapshot from my tablet. I was in the room at the same time. And each one of these circles represents a part of the story. And you can see here some branches starting to happen. And on the right hand side, there's some more branches. And I could see in real time what decision everybody was making, where everybody was in the experience. So absolutely amazing and a great example of how 360 video can be made interactive. AR and VR are not at war. So, um, and, and to be fair, I'm, I'm bringing this up from one of our reports because this kind of uh, presents some view as to why people think this. Sometimes we compare augmented reality and virtual reality, as you can see here. This is a continuation of the report I mentioned earlier. It's called Seeing is Believing, if you want to check it out. Um, but here we said augmented reality will continue to provide the bigger boost to GDP compared to VR. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. One is that the technology is becoming a default part of everyone's pocket. Um, and the second reason is that there are a lot more applications that relate to the real world than then relate to the digital or virtual world. But that doesn't mean that um, that the two technologies are are fighting one another. There is very little cannibalization there because they have different focus areas. Virtual reality is all about immersion. Augmented reality is all about information at least most of the time. So that's a good way of thinking about how these technologies approach different problems and provide solutions to them. So this is the last one I'll talk about, and probably the most importantly, VR is most certainly not dead. And I can understand why, why everybody might think that. You know, you keep reading these, these headlines here year after year, and the year of VR is not a thing. I've been collecting these articles for fun for many years now. I didn't quite get a 2021 uh, version in time for this presentation, but I'm going to be keeping an eye out for the rest of the year to see if I can bring that back and bring it on board. So why is virtual reality not mainstream yet, though? We keep hoping for it. We keep pushing for it. But why is it not yet there? To help answer that question, we've got to first, we've got to define mainstream adoption. And the way I define it is very lazily, I point to a, a much more um, a knowledgeable expert. Uh, this is from a book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, where he describes this jump between um, the visionaries or the early adopters of technology and the early, major uh, the early majority as being crossing the chasm into the mainstream market. 
So I said, okay, let's take that as a definition. So two and a half percent plus thirteen and a half percent is seventeen is is sixteen percent. So when you jump into seventeen percent, that's when you hit the mainstream market. Let's take that as as our definition. How long do you think it took all of these different technologies in our past, the landline, the microwave, the radio, the internet, the computer, and the tablet to reach 17% market penetration? And when I say how many years, the starting point here is from the first year that it became viable to sell to consumers and was available in the market that you could just buy you know, in a department store at a reasonable price or on the internet for newer technologies. There are your answers. Complete range, and some, some of you may find this very surprising, but really old technologies like the radio took only six years to reach mainstream adoption. Whereas, um, you know, technologies that we're still using right now, like the landline, took 29 years to reach mainstream adoption. Virtual reality, as far back as I could go while maintaining that definition of being available and viable to consumers, I went back as far as 1993. So that brings us to 27, 28 years that VR has been pushing to get into mainstream adoption. That is certainly not quick, but it's definitely not outside the range of mainstream adoption of these other technologies. So it is within that realm. And if you, if you speak to analysts in the market, they'll predict right now that technology based on surveys is between anywhere between 6% and 16%. So in some cases, it might be right on the cusp of mainstream adoption, which is particularly exciting for what's happening in the future. Emilios did me a massive favor, plugged my book, so I'm not gonna go over this, but if anyone wants to check it out, a lot of the case studies I talk about and a lot of the information is covered in the book and misconceptions is a big area that I cover there. And I was keen to draw it out to you today uh, to, to, uh, to understand a bit more about virtual reality and augmented reality. And uh, hopefully you found that useful. I'm more than happy to uh, to answer any questions. And uh, if you want to get in touch, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, and you can use my email as well. Great. Amazing. Thank you so much. Jeremy. No problem at all. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. So um, any questions, Emilio, Jennifer? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Sorry, I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. First of all, I just wanted to say um, thank you, Jeremy. Now, Jeremy mentioned um, uh, uh, in his presentation there was uh, some information regarding from some, from some slides from the report. And I wanted to just touch base about that report because when we did have the pleasure of speaking uh, to each other um, a few weeks back with Aroma when we were uh, initially brainstorming how we could potentially collaborate. I just had to tell um, Jeremy that, you know, during lockdown, um, myself and the team, we read the Seeing is Believing report. And I just had to give um, a really big, um, sorry, shout out to um, Louise Liu, uh, Luke Solon, Darren Dukes, Sarah Potter, Steve Jennings, Sue Risbrook and Alex Foden and Jonathan as well, because that report is absolutely fantastic. It breaks down how VR and AR are transforming businesses and the economy to create value, reducing cost, broken down into eight distinct categories, sorry, five, uh, five distinct categories, product and service development, healthcare, development and training, process improvement, and real t retail and consumer. So if you guys haven't had the chance, to go and look at that report, please go and look at that report. It's absolutely brilliant. There's also a summary that gives five tips for how to get started. Number one, focus on solving business problems. Number two, think about more than just software. Number three, create a seamless experience. Number four, get stuck in with a test case. Number five, measure the result and act. Recording. You do you do a better job than me, Emilios, at uh, summarizing this report. I should have just brought you up on stage. <laughs> yeah, it, it inspired us to, to get involved in the industry and, and try to make it uh, where, where we could. And, really yeah, and if I can jump off of that, um, Emilios' uh, summary was great. And the last thing that he mentioned was measurement. And Jeremy, um, as an executive within um, large enterprises, 
Um, I'm always keen on understanding exactly where emerging tech can play a role and what types of measurement can give me the confidence in further investment. Can you speak a little bit with regards to um, um, maybe maybe to the executives out there with regards to what type of measurement is available to actually really kind of target some ROI and make some smart decisions around further investment in the space? Absolutely, absolutely. It's a good question. So I would, when you think about ROI, think about what businesses are interested in, what, what their their sort of um, their drivers are. And those drivers, regardless of, of what industry you're in, or even to a large extent, what business you're in, those drivers are going to be revenue generation. So that's boosting existing revenues or creating new revenues. It's going to be reducing costs. It's going to be saving time or creating efficiencies uh, in an, another way of putting it, taking products to market faster. Um, it's going to be if you're in the learning and development team, for example, it's going to be greater knowledge retention of information. Um, it's going to be, you know, a higher engagement with the content itself, greater focus during the training itself, greater, uh, more effective outcomes when it comes to actually putting that training into practice. And you can see where I'm going with this. You can really dig into the function of the ind of, of the business operations, sales and marketing, learning and development find those enablers that really matter to that function and then work from there to build the measurement. So for example, it might be, let's take um, if a retail, if a retail, uh, a retailer like Poison, the, the, the Chinese company I mentioned, if they integrate virtual reality, uh, uh, sorry, augmented reality into their mobile phone and allow consumers to engage with it in such a, um, a new way, then it might be worth them looking at how many people are they converting to actual sales, you know, based on that new technology being implemented. So use that as a framework and apply it in those different industries using the ideas I mentioned below. And I think that will give you some sense of how to approach this return on investment question. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, that was... Sorry, so, Elias, I thought you. Were, I was thought you were trying to say something there. <laughs> Jeremy, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but I had to. Now I checked your LinkedIn profile. Um, for those that don't know, Jeremy does happen to be a chartered accountant. However, he advertised that uh, too loudly. Uh, Jeremy, please tell me. Um, prior to joining the innovation team, you were working as a business recovery consultant primarily involved in the running of high-profile companies in distress, oil refineries, banks, hospitals, video game stores. As it says on your profile, you were in the thick of it every time and learned a lot from that experience. What made you make that, what, what pushed you to make that decision to jump into the innovation team? Because I can say it's very different. Uh, yeah, what, yeah, where did that come from? I've I've had I've had a really weird career, Emilios. I've uh, I've taught mathematics online. I've summarised lecture notes for disabled students at universities. I've dealt with stock management in uh, department stores. Um, I was a software developer for three days. So that's a story we'll go into another time. <laughs> um, I've, as you said, I've done business recovery, chartered accountant. I was in audit, but you know. I think I did this because I was trying to explore where my real passion lay or where my interest area that I wanted to progress was. So I was I got there because I knew in a wide sense, I wanted to be involved with technologies. And in a slightly narrower sense, I wanted to be involved in emerging technologies. And that I, the opportunity I found at the time was in innovation. And through that path, I managed to meander along to specializing in virtual reality and augmented reality simply because I find the technology absolutely amazing. And I think it's I'm 100 percent sold. I I'm investing my or, or betting my entire career on this industry. And, and I don't think I'm going to end up losing because this is this technology has so much impact in our personal lives and professional lives. And that's already proven to me. The business case is already done and proven. It's just about proving it to others in the industry so that we can get it into the mainstream. Thank you. No worries at all.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, your session is, is simply amazing. Like, uh, especially the example you shared about how, is it in Madrid or what? Spanish. The Spanish club was um, incorporating XR to create like an experience for those that are not within the stadium to view. That's amazing. And um, I personally feel with the whole pandemic, more businesses are now adopting XR, right, which is great. Where I believe we need to put, put more effort to have that break post COVID. So there will not be like a drawback in the adoption of um, the technology. Absolutely. And I hope with you and your organization, we'll be able to see more innovation and amazing solutions coming out within the XR space. Absolutely. So thank you so no much. Doubt. For your time. I'll continue to push it. Thank yeah, you, yeah, Jeremy. Me thanks, Jennifer. Thank and thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Jeremy. Bye, Jeremy. Bye bye. So thank you all for joining us. Um, the next session will be coming up in a bit, and um, super excited. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right, uh, bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.